The essay uh, that I am going to, to read to you, The Crime, was written in 1920, and it appears in a book of mine called And Even Now. On a bleak, wet, stormy afternoon at the outset of last year's spring, I was in a cottage, all alone, and knowing that I must be all alone till evening. It was a remote cottage in a remote county and had been let furnished by its owner. My spirits are easily affected by weather and I hate solitude and I dislike to be master of things that are not mine. Be careful not to break us, say the glass and china. You'd better not spill ink on me, growls the carpet. None of your dog's earring, thumb marking, back breaking tricks here, snarl the books. The books in this cottage looked particularly disagreeable. Horrid little upstarts of this and that sc scarlet of cerulean series of standard authors. Having gloomily surveyed them, I turned my back on them and watched the rain streaming down the latticed window, of which uh, the panes seemed likely to be shattered at any moment by the wind. I have known men who constantly visit the Central Criminal Court, who visit also the scenes where famous crimes were committed, and form their th own theories of those crimes, and collect uh, souvenirs of those crimes, and call themselves criminologists. As for me, my interest in crime is, alas, uh, merely morbid. I did not know, as those others would doubtless have known, that the situation in which I found myself was precisely of the kind most conducive to the darkest deeds. I did but bemoan it, and think of Leah in the hovel on the heath. The wind howled in the chimney, and the rain had begun to sputter right down it, so that the fire was beginning to hiss in a very sinister manner. Suppose the fire went out. It looked as if it meant to. I snatched the pair of bellows that hung beside it. I plied them vigorously, now mind, not too vigorously, we aren't yours, they wheezed. I handled them more gently, but I did not release them till they had secured me a steady blaze. I sat down before that blaze. Despair had been warded off. Gloom, however, remained, and gloom grew. I felt that I should prefer anyone's thoughts to my own. I rose, I returned to the books, a dozen or so of those which were on the lowest of the three shelves were full-sized, were octavo, looking as though they had been bought to be read. I would exercise my undoubted right to read one of them. Which of them? I gradually decided on a novel by a well-known writer whose works, though I had several times had the honour of meeting her, were known to me only by repute. I knew nothing of them that was not good. The lady's output, as it is called, had not been at all huge, and it was agreed that her, her level was high. I had always gathered that the chief characteristic of her work was its great vitality. The book in my hand was a third edition of her latest novel, and at the end of it were numerous press notices, at which I glanced for confirmation. Immense vitality, yes, said one critic. Full, said another, of an intense vitality. A book that will live said a third. How on earth did he know that? I was, however, very willing to believe in the vitality of this writer for all present purposes, 
Vitality was a thing in which she herself, her talk, her glance, her gestures, abounded. She and they had been, I remembered, rather too much for me. The first time I met her, she said something that I lightly and mildly disputed. On no future occasion did I stem any opinion of hers. Not that she had been rude, far from it. She had but in a sisterly, brotherly way, and yet in a way that was filially eager to, asked me to explain my point. I did my best. She was all attention. But I was conscious that my best under her eye was not good. She was quick to help me. She said for me just what I had tried to say and proceeded to show me just exactly why I was wrong. I smiled the gallant smile of a man who regards women as all the more adorable because logic is not their strong point, bless them. She asked, not aggressively, but strenuously, as one who dearly loves a joke, what I was smiling at. Altogether a chastening encounter, and my memory of it was tinged with a feeble resentment. How she had scored. No man likes to be worsted in argument by a woman, and I fancy that to be vanquished by a feminine writer is the kind of defeat least of all agreeable to a man who writes. A sex war, we are often told, is to be one of the features of the world's future. Women demanding the right to do men's work and men refusing, resisting, counter-attacking. It seems likely enough. One can believe anything of the world's future. Yet one conceives that not all men, if this particular evil comes to pass, will stand packed shoulder to shoulder against all women. One does not feel that the doctors will be very bitter against such women as want to be miners, or the plumbers frown much upon the, the would-be steeple gills. I myself have never had any of my sense of fitness uh, jarred, nor a spark of animosity roused in me by a woman practising any of the fine arts, except the art of writing. That she should write a few little poems or pincées, or some impressions of a trip in a diabia as far as, to say, Biskra, or even a short story or two, seems to me not wholly amiss, even though she do such things for publication, but that she should be an habitual professional author with a passion for her art and a fountain pen and an agent and sums down in advance of royalties on sales in Canada and Australia and a profound knowledge of human character and an essentially sane outlook is somehow incongruous with my notions, my mistaken notions, if you will, of what she ought to be has a profound knowledge of human character and an essentially sane outlook, said one of the critics quoted at the end of the book that I had chosen. The wind and the rain in the chimney had not abated, but the fire was burning up bravely. So would I. I would read cheerfully and without prejudice. I poked the fire and pushing my chair slightly back lest the heat should warp the book's covers, I began chapter one. A woman sat writing in a summer house at the end of a small garden that overlooked a great valley in Surrey. The description of her was calculated to make her very admirable, a thorough woman, not strictly beautiful, but likely to be thought beautiful by those who knew her well not dressed as though she gave much heed to her clothes, but dressed in a fashion that exactly harmonised with her special type. Her pen travelled rapidly across the foolscap, and while it did so, she was described in more and more detail. But at length she came to a knotty point, it was called, a knotty point in what she was writing. 
She paused, she pushed back the hair from her temples, she looked forth at the valley, and now the valley was described, but uh, not at all exhaustively, for the writer soon overcame her difficulty and her pain travelled faster than ever, till suddenly there was a cry of Mammy, and in rushed a seven-year-old child in conjunction with whom she was more than ever admirable, after which the narrative skipped back across eight years, and the woman became a girl, giving as yet no token of future eminence in literature, but, oh, I had an impulse which I obeyed almost before I was conscious of it. Nobody could have been more surprised than I at what I had done, done so neatly, so quietly and gently. The book stood closed, upright, with its back to me, just as on a bookshelf, behind the bars of the grate. There it was, and it gave forth, as the flames crept up the blue cloth sides of it, a pleasant, though acrid, smell. My astonishment had passed, giving place to an exquisite satisfaction. How pottering and fumbling a thing was even the best kind of written criticism. I understood the contempt felt by the man of action for the man of words. But what pleased me most was that at last, actually, I, at my age, I, of all people, had committed a crime, was guilty of a crime. I had power to revoke it. I might write to my bookseller for an unburnt copy and place it on the shelf where this one had stood, this uh, gloriously glowing one. I would do nothing of the sort. What I had done, I had done. I would wear forever on my conscience the white rose of theft and the red rose of arson. If hereafter the owner of this cottage happened to miss that volume, let him. If he were fool enough to write to me about it, would I share my grand secret with him? No. Gently, with his poker, I prodded that volume further among the coals. The all but consumed binding shot forth little tongues of bright colour, flamelets of sapphire, amethyst, emerald. Charming. Could even the author herself not admire them? Perhaps. Poor woman, I had scored now, scored so perfectly that I felt myself to be almost a brute while I poked off the loosened black outer pages and led the fire on to pages that were pale brown. These were quickly devoured, but it seemed to me that whenever I left the fire to forage for itself, it made little headway. I pushed the book over on, onto its side, the flames closed on it, but presently, licking their lips, fell back as though they had had enough. I took the tongs and put the book upright again and raked it fore and aft. It seemed almost as thick as ever. With poker and tongs, I carved it into two, three sections, the inner pages flashing white as when they were sent to the binders. Strange. Aforetime, a book was burnt now and again in the marketplace by the common hangman. Was he, I wondered, paid by the hour? I had always supposed the th whole thing quite easy for him a bright little, a brisk little conflagration, and so home. Perhaps other books were less resistant than this one. I began to feel that the critics were more right than they knew. Here was a book that had indeed an intense vitality, and an immense vitality. It was a book that would live, do what one might. I vowed it should not live. I subdivided it, spread it, redistributed it. Ever and anon my eye would be caught by some sentence or fragment of a sentence 
in the midst of a charred page before the, the flames crept over it. Always loathed you, but I remember. And Ning, Tolstoy was right. Who would always loathed whom? And uh, what was Ning? And uh, and what what had Tolstoy been right about? I had an absurd but genuine desire to know. Too late. Confound the woman, she was scoring again. I furiously drove her pages into the yawning crimson jaws of the coals. Those jaws had lately been golden. Soon, to my horror, they seemed to be growing grey. They seemed to be closing uh, on, on nothing. Flakes of black paper, full-sized layers of paper, brown and white, began to hide them from me altogether. I sprinkled a box full of wax matches. I resumed the bellows. I lunged with the poker. I held a newspaper over the whole grate. I did all that inspiration could suggest or skill accomplish. Vainly. The fire went out, darkly, dismally, gradually, quite out. How she had scored again. But she did not know it. I felt no bitterness against her as I lay back in my chair, inert, listening to the storm that was still raging. I blamed only myself. I had done wrong. The small room became very cold. Whose fault was that but my own? I had done wrong hastily, but had done it and been glad of it. I had not remembered the words a wise king wrote long ago, that the lamp of the wicked shall be put out, and that the way of transgressors is hard. In the year 1935, the BBC had a series of weekly talks about important cities. Each city was talked of by a man whose birthplace it was. My own talk was about London and was broadcast on Sunday evening, December the 29th. One of the greatest of Englishmen said that the man who is tired of London is tired of life. Well, Dr. Johnson had a way of being right, but he had a way of being wrong too, otherwise we shouldn't love him so much. And I think that a man who is tired of London may merely be tired of life in London. He won't certainly feel any such fatigue if he was born and bred in a distant county and came to London and beheld London only when he had reached maturity. Almost all the impassioned lovers of London have spent, like Dr Johnson, their childhood and adolescence in the country. Such was not my own fate. I was born within the sound of bow bells. I am, in fact, a genuine Cockney, as you will already have guessed from my accent. Before I was able to speak or think, my eyes must have been familiar with endless vistas of streets, countless people passing by without a glance at the dear little fellow in the perambulator, any number of cart horses drawing carts, cab horses drawing cabs, carriage horses drawing carriages through the more or less smoke-laden atmosphere. I was smoke-dried before I could reason and prattle. For me, there never was the great apocalyptic moment of initiation into the fabulous metropolis. I never said, so this is 
London. Years passed, I became a small boy, and I dare say I used to exclaim, so these are Kensington Gardens. I liked the grass and the trees, but there were the, uh, the railings that bounded them, and the pavements and thoroughfares beyond the railings. These had no magic for me. It was the country, the real country, the, the not imitation country that I loved. I became a young man. London was the obvious place for me to earn a living in. In my native city, I abode until the year 1910, at which time I was 37 years old. Then I escaped. I had known some parts of the vast affair pretty well. I wish I had appreciated their beauty more vividly while it lasted. A beauty that is gone, or all but gone. I am going to be depressing. Perhaps you'd uh, better switch me off. London is a cathedral town. And in my day, in the 1880s of my boyhood and the 90s of my youth, London, with all her faults, seemed not wholly unlike a cathedral town, I do assure you. There was a demure poetry about her. One could think of her as her. Nowadays, she cannot be called she. She is essentially it. Down by the docks, along the Mile End Road, throughout the arid reaches of South Kensington and so on, I dare say she was it already, full of later 19th century utilitarianism and deficiency, throwing out harsh hints of what the 20th century held up its horrid sleeve. But in such districts as I liked, and whenever I could, frequented, she kept the 18th century about her. Hampstead, upon its hill, was a little old remote village, and so was Chelsea, down yonder by the river. Mayfair and Westminster and St James's were grand, of course, very urban in a proudly unostentatious way. There were Victorian intrusions here and there in their architecture, but the 18th century still reigned beautifully over them. They were places of leisure, of, of leisure, one might almost have said in the old-fashioned way. And very urban though they were, they were not incongruous with rusticity. St. James's Park seemed a natural appanage to St. James's Street, and the two milkmaids who milked two cows there and sold the milk did not seem strangely romantic. The Green Park seemed not out of keeping with the houses of Piccadilly, nor did the Piccadilly goat strike strike one as more than a little odd in Piccadilly. I don't know much about him, though I so often saw him and liked him so much. He lived in a large mews in a side street opposite to Gloucester House, the home of the, the venerable Duke of Cambridge. At about ten o'clock in the morning he would come treading forth with a delicately clumsy gait down the side street, come very slowly, as though not quite sure there mightn't be some grass for him to nibble at between the paving stones. Then he would pause at the corner of Piccadilly and flop down against the railings of the nearest house. He would remain there till luncheon time and return in the early afternoon. He was a large, handsome creature, with great intelligence in his amber eyes. He never slept. 
he was always interested in the passing scene. I think nothing escaped him. I wish he could have written his memoirs when he finally retired. He had seen, day by day, much that was worth seeing. He had seen a constant procession of the best-built vehicles in the world, drawn by very beautifully bred and beautifully groomed and beautifully harnessed horses, and containing very ornate people. Vehicles of the most diverse kinds, high-swung barouches with immense armorial bearings on their panels, driven by fat, white-wigged coachmen and having powdered footmen up behind them. Signorial phaetons, daring tandems, discreet little broughams, brown or yellow, flippant high dog carts, low but flippant rally carts, very frivolous private hansoms shaming the more serious public ones. And all these vehicles went by with a cheerful briskness. There was hardly ever a block for them in the traffic. And their occupants were very visible and were looking their best. The occupants of those low-roofed machines, which are so pitifully blocked nowadays all along Piccadilly, may, for aught one knows, be looking their best. But they aren't on view. The student of humanity must be content to observe the pedestrians. These, I fear, would pain my old friend the goat. He was accustomed to what was called the man about town, a now extinct species, a lost relic of the 18th century and of the days before the Great Reform Bill of 1831. A leisurely personage, attired with great elaboration on his way to one of his many clubs, not necessarily interesting in himself, but fraught with external character and point, very satisfactory to those for whom the visible world exists. From a sociological standpoint, perhaps he was all wrong, and perhaps his successor, the earnest fellow in a trilby and a Burberry and earnest horn-rimmed spectacles hurrying along to his job or in quest of some job, is all right. But one does rather wish the successor looked as if he felt himself to be all right. Let him look serious by all means, but need he look so nervous? He needs must. He doesn't want to be killed. He doesn't want even to be run over at the next crossing. He must keep his wits about him. I advise him to dash down with me into one of the tubes. He will be safer there, as were the early Christians in the catacombs. They are not beautiful, these tubes, nor are they even interesting in character, except to, to engineers. But are the streets above them beautiful or interesting in character nowadays to anybody of my own kind and age? London never had any formal or obvious beauty such as you find in Paris or any great overwhelming grandeur such as Rome has. But the districts for which I loved her, and several other districts too, had a queer beauty of their own, and were intensely characteristic, inalienably Londonish. To an intelligent foreigner visiting London for the first time, uh, what would you hasten to show? Except some remains here and there, and some devious little nooks, there is nothing that would excite or impress him. The general effect of the buildings that have sprung up everywhere in recent years is not such an effect as the intelligent foreigner may not have seen 
in divers other places, uh, Chicago, for example, or Berlin, or Pittsburgh. London has been cosmopolitanized, democratized, commercialized, mechanized, standardized, vulgarized so extensively that one's pride in showing it to a foreigner is changed to a wholesome humility. One feels rather as Virgil may have felt in showing hell to Dante. It is a bright, cheerful, a salubrious hell, certainly, but still, to my mind, hell. In some ways, a better place, I readily concede, than it was in my day and in days before mine. Heinrich Heine was horrified by the poverty, the squalor and starvation that abounded in the midst of the immense wealth and splendor. Some years later, Gavarni's soul was shocked by it, and then Dostoevsky's, and presently Monsieur Ludovic Alevis, and in due course, Mr. Henry James's. I too am human. I am therefore glad that Seven Dials and similar places, which I used to skirt with romantic horror, are gone. Had I been acting as guide to those distinguished visitors, I should have tried to convince them that no such places existed except in the creative alien fancy. But I ask myself, suppose those illustrious visitors rose from their graves today and asked me to show them round the sites that would best please their aesthetic sensibilities in the London of this year of grace, what should I say, what do, in my patriotic embarrassment? I suppose I would, with vague waves of the hand, stammeringly redirect them to their graves. I could not ask them to accompany me along Piccadilly or up Park Lane to admire the vast excesses of contemporary architecture. I could not say to them, never mind the razor of certain unassuming houses that were called great houses in your day and in mine. Cast up your eyes, up, 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 at the houses that have displaced them. Try to count the little uniform slits that serve as windows in the splendid ferro-concrete surface. Admire the austerity of the infinite ensemble. Think how inspiring to the historic imagination it would all be a century or so hence. I couldn't speak thus for I cannot imagine any history being made in these appallingly bleak yet garish tenements. Or oh, at any rate, I refuse to suppose that they or any of the similar monstrosities that have been springing up in all the more eligible districts could ever take on an historic tone. They will continue to look like, oh, what shall I say, what? What do they look like? Improper workhouses. Odious though they are in themselves, one might not hate them so much if one found them on some barren play in, say, the, the Middle West of America, some plain as barren and as meaningless as they. But when one thinks of the significant houses the old habitable homes that were demolished to make way for them, and when one sees how what remains of decent human architecture is reduced by them to the scale of hardly noticeable hovels, then one's heart sickens and one's tongue curses the age into which one has survived. A few years ago, in the print room of the British Museum, my friend Mr. Lawrence Binion showed me a very ancient little watercolour drawing. The foreground of it 
was a rather steep, grassy slope. And at the foot of the slope stood a single building, which I at once recognised as St James's Palace. Beyond the palace were stretches of green meadows, and far away there was just one building, the Abbey of Westminster. And I thought how pained the artist would have been if he had foreseen the coming of St James's Street. I felt sure that he, like myself, preferred the country to any town. Yet I could not find it in my heart to deplore the making of that steep little street destined to be so full of character and history. I could only record that my favourite street was being steadily degraded year after year by the constructive vandals. There are no actual skyscrapers in it as yet but already the palace cuts a poor figure, and the beautiful façade of Boodles is sadly squat, and a certain little old but ever young shop that stands somewhere between those two is hardly visible to the naked eye. I would affectionately name it, were I not so anxious to obey the BBC's admirable ban against that greatest of all modern pests, the advertiser. Regent Street, Nash's masterpiece, which is mourned so bitterly by so many people, was never very dear to my heart, even before the days when Norman Shaw's pseudo-Florentine fortress suddenly sprang up and ruined the scale of its quadrant and of all the rest of it. Its tone was always rather vulgar. It was never anything but a happy haunt hunting ground for ardent shoppers. Nothing but shopping had ever happened in it. But it was a noble design, and when its wide road and pavements were empty in the dawn, and its level copings were pale against the smokeless sky, the great long strong curve of the smooth-faced houses had a beauty that I shall not forget. I conceive that the pretentious chaos now reigning in its stead must, in the quiet magic of the dawn, be especially nasty. It was the squares that particular glory of London that I loved best of all. Their green centres have not yet been built over for some reason. I look with pleasure at the surviving grass and trees, but I try not to see from the corners of my eyes what has happened to their architecture. St James's Square, the finest of them all, has been wrecked utterly. Barclay Square, which was a good second, has suffered a like fa fate. So has Portman Square. Dear little old Kensington Square has been saved by the obstinacy of some enlightened tenants from the clutches of mammon. Bedford Square is an intact as yet. Let us be thankful before it is too late for much of Bloomsbury. The London University is about to play the deuce there. I suppose the inns of court, those four sanctuaries of civilization, are safe in the adroit hands of the lawyers. Parliament will not be able to betray them as she has betrayed that other sanctuary, the Adelphi. I revisit England and London at intervals of two or three years, and every time I find the, that the havoc that has been wrought in my absence is more than ever excessive. How do I contrive to bear it? Let me reveal that secret. As I go my rounds, I imagine that the present is the past. I imagine myself 
a man of the 21st century, a person with an historic sense whose prayer that he should behold the London of a hundred years ago has been granted. And my heart is thrilled with rapture. Look, there's a horse drawing a cart. Oh, and look, there's a quite small house, a lovely little thing that looks as though it had been built by the hand of man and as though a man might live quite pleasantly in it. It has a chimney with smoke coming out of it. And there's a coal heaver. And there, yes, it must be, it is a muffin man. By such devices of make-believe do I somewhat console and brace myself. But there is always a dead weight of sadness in me. Selfish sadness. I ought to keep my pity for the young people who never saw what I have seen, who will live to see what I shall not see, future great vistas of more and more commercialism, more machinery, more standardization, more nullity. I warned you that I was going to be depressing. I wish I hadn't kept my word. I might well have broken it on an evening so soon after Christmas, so soon before the New Year. Forget this talk, or at any rate, discount it. Remember that after all, I'm only an old fogey, and perhaps rather an old fool. And let me assure you, that I'm cheerful company enough whenever I'm not in London and not thinking of London. And now I'm just off to the country. I have arranged to be driven straight from Broadcasting House to Paddington. I shall just catch the train. Uh, I wish you all a very happy New Year uh, somewhere in the country. I, uh, I hope I haven't advertised Paddington. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, good night.